Much of my production is focused on making many dozens of the same shape, be it mugs, bowls, teapots, ink dip pens, and all manner of other objects. So every now and then, I'll spend an afternoon throwing a few boards of work where no two pots are alike. It could be a variety of vases, or a selection of different mugs, or lidded jars. And so, in this video, I'll be taking you through how I make a very simple angular vase, from a lump of soft clay, which you can see me wedging up here, to the finished, fired, and glaze covered object. This is a lump of high iron stoneware clay, which I wedge up to make it nice and even in terms of texture, and void of any air pockets, and I also make sure it has a rounded base. That way when I slam it against the wheel head, it doesn't trap any air beneath it. It's positioned as centrally as possible, and then squashed into the very middle of the wheel, with lots of water or slip. But I don't just leave the lump stationary, instead to really centre it, I cone it up and down a number of times, a process that aligns the particles and helps the lump of clay become even more even and smooth than it can ever be after only being wedged. Whenever I lay my hands on the lump of spinning clay, I need to make sure there's water either on the lump of clay or my fingers, so that the stoneware can spin without sticking to my hands, as if they do stick, the clay sticks to my hands, slows down and gets drawn off centre, which is the opposite of what I'm trying to do at this point, as ideally before a pot can be thrown, this initial lump needs to be manipulated to the point where it's spinning perfectly evenly, without any slight wobbles or undulations anywhere in it. Although that is asking a lot, especially when you're first starting out in this craft, and truth be told, it's worth trying to make pots and seeing them through to the end, even if your initial lump isn't perfectly centred, as you'll learn a tremendous amount by pulling up the walls and shaping the vessel, which may actually help you get better at centering the lump of clay initially. Eventually, centering will become second nature, but that doesn't mean that every single pot I throw is perfectly centred. Often there are small wobbles, and you'll see it in the rim usually, as it bumps up and down ever so slightly as it spins. The truth is, as long as it's only subtle, as soon as the wheel stops spinning, you won't even be able to see it, as it's the fact that the pot is rotating quickly, which makes the irregularity so glaringly obvious. All of this is to say that I can live with a small undulation. I make hand-thrown and turned pots after all, and in the grand scheme of things, the work I make is finished quite a high degree, but there are potters out there whose pots are incredibly wobbly, they're wonky and there are fingerprints in them and they look anything but scented, yet they are still well made and show the hands of the maker, which is one of the things that makes handmade pots so interesting, so enticing and so personal to some degree, as instead of using an object that's made in some factory somewhere and is but one of tens of thousands of lifeless objects, handmade pots even the mugs and bowls I make by the hundred are always each a bit different. There are different marks left by my fingers and the tools I use, and the kiln gives its own life to the pots too. And all of that is just one of the reasons I love making handmade pots. After the clay is centred, a hollow is made in the centre of that lump, and then I begin to draw the walls up in numerous pools, focusing on distributing the clay evenly throughout the walls so the piece isn't bottom heavy. I want to create a vase that's both quite rounded and very angular. This means I'll be pushing out the belly of this shape quite a lot, which also means at this stage I shouldn't thin out the walls in the middle of this piece too much, as otherwise I won't be able to stretch them out. I also leave the rim purposefully thick at this point, as it gives the piece more strength, and it also means I can use that clay later on to collar in the top and form the rim. But for now, with each pull, I'll begin throwing the rough shape of the pot I want. As I do this, I ease the walls out gradually, rather than trying to throw the perfect shape immediately. And typically this is something you always do when throwing and trimming pots on the wheel. You don't want to rush any process, such as trying to pull up too much clay at once, as doing so can cause a thin spot to appear at the base with all that weight above it. And normally if that happens, that thin spot will buckle and the pot will collapse. The same goes for when shaping pots, especially for those which aren't just straight cylinders. So I belly the form out gradually, rather than trying to do it all in one go. And as you can see on this piece, there is a slight wobble that's materialised in the rim, but I'll deal with that a bit later. For now, it's time to throw the more distinct angles into this shape. There's the lower portion, which I always try to make account for at least half of the overall height of the vessel as proportionally that's what seems to look best, and it keeps the pot from looking stout and clumsy. 
with the lowest angle approximately thrown. Next, I do the waist, which angles inward ever so slightly. And at this point, after being stretched out, it's easily the thinnest part of the pot. Next, I throw the shoulder. And for this part, as it overhangs, I always keep one hand inside, supporting the wall from underneath, which prevents it from slumping inward, potentially. The wobble in the rim does throw me off a bit, especially when it comes to throwing this portion of the pot. So at this point, I'll take a sharp potter's needle, which is steadily pushed through the rim, just below the lowest point of the undulation. As soon as I can feel the needle on my finger on the inside of the form, I lift both hands away together, taking the excess clay away with them. The rim can then be compressed and gingerly corrected, and then it's thrown to be more vertical, and so it tapers to a finer point, as the glazes I use tend to react nicely over sharp edges like this. I then spent a little more time refining the form, easing out the angles, getting the pot to the point I want it so it can be tidied up and removed from the wheel. This process of tidying the pot up begins with all the water being sponged out from the inside, as if it's left in the pot overnight. It can weaken the base as the clay becomes too saturated with water, so I remove practically all of it. And then with the throwing stick, I just eased out the middle section just a tiny bit more by pushing the curved end of the wooden tool out against the soft clay without much resistance from the outside. I then scrape away the skirt of clay from around the bottom, correcting the form so it angles in and matches the walls above it. I then use a straight edged metal kidney to scrape away the slip from the outer surface, leaving a lovely smooth finish. And instead of digging the metal harshly into the clay, I'm in fact pushing the clay out against the metal edge whilst the tool more or less stays stationary. Doing it this way round typically causes less issues, such as the relatively dry clay of the walls suddenly sticking to the metal tool and violently being drawn off centre and the pot destroyed. To clean up the middle part of this pot, I switch to a metal kidney that has a sharper edge, which once again I push the clay from the inside out against it, and I move my fingers on the inside gradually up against that metal edge to remove as much of the slip as possible. Slip, for those who don't know, is just really saturated clay. It has the consistency of cream, and it's what you can see coating much of the wheel and the upper shoulder, which I'm now scraping over. If I were to leave this on the pot, it would dry eventually, but that process would take far longer than necessary, and there's no way I can pick a pot off the wheel if it is covered in slip, as the sticky slip covering the pot just sticks to my hands, and there's no real way of making a firm grip on the piece without my hands just slipping off or distorting the pot. Even if I were able to pick up the slip-covered vessel, popping it down on the wearboard creates another issue, as my now slip-covered hands won't easily release from the pot, and as I drag them off, the pot will likely be deformed as my hands detach. So, removing the slip helps the pot to dry out faster, but it also means that it leaves the surface relatively dry. And as I dry my hands as well, I can easily pick the pot off and place it down without anything sticking, or the pot being deformed. And that's the first step of this pot's creation done. Next, as it's still so soft, I'll leave the pot out overnight so that it can dry until it's a state we call leather hard. And it's called that for a reason, because as the moisture leaves the clay, the material hardens and feels like cold leather, and it goes from shimmering to having a much more matte appearance. And at this point, the piece can be picked up and handled. It's much stronger, though it is still quite brittle. And if you push the wall with a thumb, or accidentally knock it, you'll easily deform the walls, or even crack them. So, to start, I need to attach the pot back to the wheel, and I do this by brushing slip over the base, and then tap centering the pot back into the middle. The slip quickly dries, welding the pot in place. I also squash a tiny portion of the wall against the metal wheel head, using the corner of a plastic kidney. Next, the trimming can begin. This is the process of shaving away the outer layers of the pot, which removes some of the excess weight and refines the shape. These are my trimming tools. There's a real mix in here, but the ones I tend to use the most are these tungsten carbide ones. They're exceedingly sharp, but very fragile, hence why I keep them in a box to keep them from rolling off my workbench and smashing on the floor. The tools I use for trimming stoneware are primarily made by Phil Poperka, of bison tools. They're difficult to get a hold of these days, as I think there's more than a year-long waiting list at this point, but they're worth every single penny if you can ever get your hands on them. 
They tear through the clay with ease, and their sharp edge lasts for such a long time. It must have turned many thousands with some of them, and they're still practically as sharp as the day I got them. Clay, as you might know, is an incredibly abrasive material, and the steel tools I have, if used to the same degree as these, wear out over the weeks and months I use them. The blade's edge blunts, and the metal wears away. Although those types of turning tools are a bit more beginner friendly, as you don't necessarily need really sharp tools to actually turn clay. They certainly help when the clay's dried out a bit too much, but they also tend to catch more, and if you aren't fully in control, or if you haven't got much turning experience, there's a chance you'll either just destroy your pot, break the tool, or even cut your fingers on the sharp blade. After I've trimmed over an area, I scrape over it with a sharp metal edge to get rid of the more prominent turning marks left by the tool, and to make sure this part of the pot is nice and straight. I then move on to the next area, trimming with a flat blade and focusing the pressure on the corner of the tool, so it really gouges away a lot of material as I run it over. The flat blade is useful though, as it helps me cut straight as I trim the pot, and as I work, and if I can, I keep my left hand inside the pot opposite the area I'm turning, that way I can feel the cross section and I can gauge whether it's too thick too thin, and usually it's with my left hand that I can sense if the pot is beginning to loosen off the wheel or become off-centred. Which does happen occasionally, the pot dislodges and flies off in a certain direction. Usually I can catch it with my left hand, as it's already there sort of waiting for something like that to happen. But if flying away is one of the risks of trimming like this, with no supportive lumps of clay around the pot or mechanical arms like you might find on a given grip. Yet, there not being any supportive arms or lumps of clay is exactly why I love this technique so much, as I can trim the entirety of the outside without anything getting in the way. I then proceed onto the shoulder, where I trim away some of the excess clay and straighten the form, but there isn't much to do in this spot. And lastly, there's the rim portion, which I use an even smaller tool for. This isn't a tungsten carbide one, but the metal has worn so thin that the metal is like a few strands of hair, and it slices viciously through the leather hard clay. But that'll only last a while, and soon the worn strand of metal will break. To detach the pot, I slide the end of a sharp metal tool underneath it. There was a bit of weight in the bottom, so I'll need to trim just a bit more away from the lower half of the vase, and of course, turn the base itself. So I flip it over and place it back down, and then gently tap the pot into the centre. I then took three lumps of relatively soft clay and carefully pushed them around the rim, not with enough pressure to actually deform the pot itself. Really, they're just making contact. If I use clay that's too soft, it can be difficult to remove afterwards. So I tried to use clay that's just a bit on the stiff side. And once fully secured in place, the trimming of the bottom of the pot can begin. But to help the piece stay pinned down, I place a spinner tool on top through which I can push down. This device distributes the pressure evenly which is particularly useful when the base of the pot is relatively thin, as if I were to just push down using my fingertips, the pressure is very focused and that could quite easily cause the base to sag inward if it is too thin. It also prevents my fingertips from rubbing against the coarse clay as it quickly spins around. Now, if I was only trimming a handful of pots, the coarse clay rubbing against my fingertips isn't really going to be enough to damage them. But if I'm spending 10 to 20 hours a week trimming pots, then a tool like this suddenly becomes very useful and stops what can be quite an uncomfortable sensation as the skin on your fingertips is slowly ground down and they become red and raw. All of the trimmings created during this process are easily recycled. I just dump them all into a bucket and then soak them with water and as they're so thin they quickly disintegrate into a fine sludge which is then mixed thoroughly, spread out on a plaster bat and once enough moisture has been removed from it it can be quickly wedged up until it resembles the clay you see at the beginning of this video, which can then be used to throw new pots with, which means there's very little or almost no waste during this process. That is, of course, until you fire the pots. Beyond that point, if you make a mistake, or a pot needs to be smashed, there's no way to reclaim that clay, unless you grind it into tiny particles, which can then be added back to the clay to act as grog. And that's actually what they do in many cases. And this grog that's added back makes the clay stronger and less likely to warp or crack as it dries. It'll even shrink less. One day I'd love to have the machinery to be able to do this, as then I would practically have no waste whatsoever, as I'd be able to recycle even glazed pots. With the lower section done, I can move my attention to the base itself, which I bevel around the outside, which creates a point of contact that's less likely to chip 
and it also makes the pot appear as if it's hovering ever so slightly over whatever surface it's placed upon. It also removes just a tiny amount of weight from the bottom of the pot. Then it's time for the base itself, which is simply trimmed flat, removing the lines that are left over from the throwing stage when the pot was wired off the wheel. Throughout this entire trimming process, I'm gripping the tool incredibly tightly. I lean my upper body weight onto my arms to help keep them stable, and I try my hardest to keep the blade steady, even when slicing through clay that's undulating slightly. You want the tool to remain steady and not have the clay you're trimming influence it, as if you are trimming and you follow the wobble in the pot, you'll only exacerbate it and make it progressively more pronounced. To check the depth, I can push down with a thumb, and if I feel like it bows in ever so slightly, I know that means the bottom is thin enough and I should stop removing material from it. But if you press it and it feels really solid, then you should keep going. And as I felt there was enough clay in this, I went over the bevel again, and these blunt steel turning tools actually leave a relatively burnished surface, compared to the tungsten carbide tools at least, which just rip through the clay, tearing out the particles of grog and leaving long scratches in the surface. To burnish the clay even further, I use a smooth metal kidney to compress the clay and really even out the surface, preparing it like a canvas for my maker's mark, which I'm going to be stamping into this area. At the same time, this will be the only exposed clay that's left on the vessel once it's fired. So I want it to be really carefully finished and considered just like the rest of the pot is. Once the lines are crisp, I can stamp it. And to do this, I use a maker's mark that I made myself, carved from a block of porcelain, the mark being opposite at this stage, as obviously it reflects once stamped. I use porcelain as it's very strong and durable. It also shrinks almost 20% once fired, which means I can carve it larger, which makes it easier to do, and then it shrinks down nicely to a much smaller mark. And whilst these few clips show this process very quickly, I've made another video which is just about carving your own maker's marks. And I'll leave a link to that on screen now and in the description below. The next step is packing all the pots once they've dried out into my electric kiln for a bisque firing to 1000 degrees Celsius. For this kiln, elements in the wall gradually heat up overnight. The pots themselves are carefully placed inside, as when bone dry, they're incredibly delicate objects, and all it takes is one knock to fracture or chip the pot. And although I didn't film this particular vase being placed inside the kiln, you can see it, top right, placed inside and balanced on top of another vase. Once full, the kiln is closed up, sealed, the power is turned on, and then the firing is started and the kiln will click into life. It fires overnight and cools down for the entirety of the next day. Then the following morning it can be unpacked and the next step for all of these pots is to have their bases waxed. This acts like any other wax resist and by coating it on the base of the pots it will prevent that area from being covered in any glaze, which is necessary because if glaze comes into contact with the kiln shelf it'll stick the pot to it, meaning it probably needs to be smashed off, likely destroying the pot and damaging the expensive kiln shelf. When I centered these, I want the most centered part to be the base, and not necessarily the rim or the sides of the pot, which you can see are wavering ever so slightly. I then very simply brush the wax over the base of the pot. And I dab just a little extra over my maker's mark make sure it's really covered. Next comes the glazing itself, and this is essentially a solution of raw materials such as nepheline cyanide, clay, feldspar, talc, and red iron oxide, hence the colour. These ingredients are mixed in a certain combination, they're like recipes, and then the pot is carefully dipped into it. Not only is the clay harder now it's been fired, but it's also absorbent like a sponge, which means as it's dipped, the water all those raw materials are suspended in is drawn into the body, leaving a layer of the raw materials on the surface of the pot, wherever there isn't wax. And it's this layer of glaze that'll ultimately melt into a layer of glass that shrouds the pot. I glaze the outside of this vessel first, and tomorrow, once the outside layer has dried, I'll coat the inside, but there were a few patches around the rim I needed to touch up. The following day, once the glaze on the outside had dried, which means the walls of the pot are no longer saturated with water, I'll coat the inside. 
which is easily done by pouring a jug of glaze inside the form. I'll then swirl the liquid about and carefully let it pour out. And as the pot has a relatively sharp rim, it shouldn't dribble over the outside, as long as I pour confidently. The thing I need to be most careful about is how I handle the outside surface of the already glazed pot. As this area is very delicate and the powdery surface, when it dries, is very easy to chip or damage, which if left uncorrected will be visible in the finished fired object. The glazed surface can sometimes be a little rough though, so the next step is to carefully fettle the outside and remove any slight discrepancies in the surface. I work over a basin of water so the excess glaze dust that falls off is collected and that way I can recycle it back into my larger bucket of glaze so once again very little is wasted. The walls don't take long but even though I wax the base of the pot there's still always some glaze that settles onto that wax surface and so this part of the vase I need to be a lot more careful about tidying it up as every last speck of red glaze needs to be removed which I simply do with a soaked sponge. I'm very careful not to wipe away too much and I try to make the line where clay and glaze meet as pristine and straight as possible. It's slow work and arduous work too but it makes a big impact on the quality of work and all that care and attention is noticeable after the object has been fired. The next step in this long process is packing the gas kiln. I fire using a Rhoda KG340 which has a capacity of 340 litres or about 12 cubic foot. And depending on the size of the pots, of course, I can usually fit anywhere between 100 to 160 pieces in each firing. Each pot is placed inside carefully so it doesn't touch anything else. There can be about 2 to 3 millimetres between each pot, but they absolutely cannot touch. Otherwise, during the firing, the glazed surface on each will melt, fuse together, and they'll have to be snapped apart or broken. It's like one big jigsaw puzzle, really as I'm trying to use the space as efficiently as possible, squeezing in as many pots as I'm physically able to. As not only will the kiln fire better in reduction, as there's less space for oxygen to physically be, but it also makes each firing more cost effective. One of the most crucial parts of packing this kiln is placing the two packs of pyrometric cones inside. I make sure I can see them through the spy holes in the door. That way I can observe them during the firing and watch as they slowly bend over due to heat work at very specific temperatures. And it's these cones really that I'm going by rather than simply reading the temperature on the digital readout. The information on which is given to me by a thermal couple that sticks into the back of the kiln. Early the following morning, the kiln is lit. And whenever you're lighting a gas kiln like this, you do it with the door open. That way there's no risk of letting gas accumulate inside and then suddenly igniting it, which may, given the right circumstances, cause an explosion. Once all four burners are lit and placed on the lowest possible setting, I close the door and seal it tight. This firing will last about nine hours from beginning to end. And unlike my electric kiln, which is completely automatic, this kiln is fired entirely by hand. So I start at about 7am in the morning and I open lots of windows to make sure there's plenty of ventilation in the studio. These are what the cones look like as they bend over during the firing. And what I'm looking for is all three slumped over like so. That's when I can switch the firing off. But that doesn't happen until the kiln has reached about 1300 degrees Celsius, which is about 2372 degrees Fahrenheit. Until reaching 860 degrees Celsius, there isn't much to do. I just occasionally increase the gas pressure and every 30 minutes on the dot, I take notes. Measuring the time, temperature, the gas pressure, the air pressure and the damper position. At 860 degrees, I initiate reduction. I do this by greatly increasing the gas pressure and the air pressure whilst throttling the flues so the exhaust can't escape so quickly. This means that inside the kiln, the gas is burning with insufficient oxygen and thus the fuel ends up finding oxygen from inside the clay and the glazes and it's that which changes the colour. If I was to put these same glazes in an electric kiln they would look entirely different and they wouldn't be nearly so nice. Towards the end of the firing I'll start opening the spy holes and looking at the cones and once I deem them sufficiently bent the gas and air pressure can be switched off. which is always a very welcome moment. Some peace, finally, after a long day of rushing gas and an air compressor that periodically bursts into life. About 36 hours later, the kiln is now cool enough to unpack. At this point, the pyrometer reads about 150 degrees Celsius, 
but usually that heat is focused around the top few shelves inside, and as soon as the door is cracked open, that last bit of heat quickly escapes. It's always an exciting moment, an anxious one too, as locking all your pots inside a kiln and exposing them to tremendous heat is quite an extreme process, and it means I don't have full control over how the final objects look, compared to say a woodworker or a painter, where you very definitely lay the last stroke. Once opened up, the pots are quickly examined. I leave them in situ for a moment, looking to see if there are any pockets of oxidation by observing the colours on the pots. Once cool enough to touch, the pots can be unpacked, and here you can see how different the cones look compared to how they were when they went in, and the pink, yellow and grey colours they had before being fired is simply due to dye that's added to the mixtures so you can tell the cones apart more easily. And there it is, the simple angular vase this video has been all about. It's shrunk about 12% from when it was first initially thrown and now has a layer of dark green crackle glaze surrounding it. As you can see, there's a tiny bit of bat wash stuck to the base. That's a protective layer that coats the kiln shelves and sometimes the iron in the clay body that melts will stick to some of it. But I'll easily be able to sand it away and that's the real final step for this process. Otherwise I unpack all the pieces and lay them out on my workbench. There's always a few surprises. Some pots I love, others I really dislike, and there's usually one or two that have cracked or the glaze has run. It's never 100% perfect, and that's one of the aspects of reduction firing I love. Once all the pots are unloaded, I'll quickly sand their bases on various grades of wet and dry sandpaper submerged underneath water. I don't want to make the bottoms of these pots completely glassy smooth, as I think that goes against the nature of the stoneware clay body itself, but I do want the clay to be smooth enough so it won't scratch any tabletops or the shelves they're placed on. Porcelain, on the other hand, as it's so fine and translucent, I'll sand to be much smoother, as it matches the nature of the clay body. And here it is, from a thrown pot to the finished, glaze-fired object, with a narrow foot and a sharp beveled rim that's ever so slightly breaking into a sort of brown, almost metallic tone as the iron-bearing clay beneath begins to shine through. It's a long process, and in actuality this will take weeks or months, as I never really work on just one object alone. But I hope this sheds some light on the process, and I hope you enjoyed this film too. And like always with these longer videos, let me know if you made it all the way through. And thanks so much if you did, and I'll see you next time.